Another feature was the variable incidence of its drooped, 35-degree swept back wing. The wing could be adjusted to various positions for takeoff and flight. The outrigger wheels stabilized the plane for takeoff and landing. For the first time, powered air brakes were incorporated and a drag parachute was used to slow landings. Epitomizing the advanced design thinking was the B-51's rotary bomb door, which allowed quick ejection of the bomb load while the plane was still flying at very high speeds. In the late 1940s, the Martin XB-51 stood as the only contender for the role of filling the shortfall that Korea was to demonstrate. Powerful and highly advanced, the B-51 was clearly pitched somewhere between fighter and bomber. Using jet-assisted takeoff, the B-51 takes to the air in one of the hundreds of tests that were carried out with it in the early 1950s to try and iron out its limitations. It was by no means a perfect aircraft, and clearly, before it was successful, it would need more development. The designers had successfully identified the task for the plane, but failed to develop a concept that really did the job. was needed than Korea allowed, and the Washington administration needed some option to the B-51, so reluctantly they were forced to consider foreign designs. World War II had seen the United States become the world's most successful aircraft manufacturing nation, and the US had some difficulty in accepting a foreign design for evaluation. But they seriously studied two. First was the Canadian CF-100. This was more truly a twin-engine fighter that was ultimately unable to carry a worthwhile payload. During World War II, the British had also studied the area between fighter and bomber, and the remarkable de Havilland Mosquito, very fast and agile, had been produced. After the war, the RAF had sought a jet-powered replacement for the Mosquito, acknowledging the need for such an aircraft. The English Electric Company had come up with the new plane, a very advanced design which was given the name Canberra. The aircraft had simple lines and combined the agility and speed of a fighter with the lifting power of a bomber. Right from the very start, the Canberras were a success, and production orders for the RAF were so large that much of the production was subcontracted to other aircraft manufacturers. The classically streamlined Canberras, robustly designed and with their powerful Avon engines, were a formula for success. However, interest from the United States was initially muted. There had never been a true equivalent American type to the Mosquito either. But in view of the Korean experience, interest grew considerably because the English Electric Company's aircraft offered a proven successful design that could do the job and would be available for early delivery if the war dragged on.
Defence Department started direct negotiations with the British about the possibility of producing the overseas design in North America, with pattern aircraft being sent over as guides. Given Martin Marietta's interest in the B-51, it was that company which was awarded the contract and was duly licensed by the original designers to produce the aircraft. In March 1951, after a record-breaking transatlantic flight, the first of the pattern aircraft landed in Baltimore, a sleek spectacle for the crowd who had gathered to see it. since the DH-4 of World War I had manufacture of a foreign plane even been contemplated, and now it was happening. With the Canberra to come into production, the gap in the US inventory would be plugged. It wasn't to see service in Korea, but was to prove its worth in combat and the wisdom of its purchase many years later. some time to come. In the post-war years, in the absence of military orders, Martin had diversified with some early success into domestic airliner manufacture. However, much hinged upon the government requirement for the high-speed, lightweight bomber. The first Patton aircraft crashed, killing the navigator, and it was left to the second British model to continue much of the testing. The American version of the Canberra would soon be on the production line but there were still many problems to be solved in making the transition from British to American standards. Even simple basics like the size of the thread on nuts and bolts differed in the two countries, and there were many more technical alterations. It was to be over two years before the top brass would be able to assemble to inspect the first machine off the Baltimore production line. aircraft appeared, they were externally almost identical to their British cousins. Perhaps the major initial technical differences were Martin's incorporation of the B-51's advanced rotary bomb bay and the replacement of the Avons with sapphire engines. 